Okay, so welcome everyone. The two lectures I will give today, or the two blocks of two hours, um, will basically address different problems that we encounter if we take images from an airplane, aerial photography, in order to build maps with that. So the first 45 minutes will kind of be connected to the bundle adjustment lecture of the last two weeks and we'll investigate what are, or basically report what are typical um, accuracies that we can obtain if we do aerial photography and also we'll take into account or we'll evaluate um, how many control points should we use in order to come up with an appropriately accurate model of the environment. The second part of the lecture today will address uh, so-called autophotos. This is a special type of photos, of uh, actually a correction of aerial images so that we can actually measure in those images. Um, before I start with the lecture today, a, a short note for those of you who only watch these lectures via videos. So unfortunately, the last 45 minutes of the recordings from last week, so the second part of the numerics of the bundle adjustment failed because the camera refused to record uh, the file appropriately, so only the 40, first 45 minutes are online. The second one I'm missing, so I highly encourage those of you who only watch the videos of the lecture to take Wolfgang Furstner's script and really go through the numerics of the bundle adjustment because this will be a kind of, it's, it's one of the key, bundle adjustment, one of the key techniques used in photogrammetry and understanding that is pretty important also uh, with respect to the exam. So I highly encourage you to uh, look onto that. I'm sorry that the, the last 45 minutes of the recordings are missing. So as I said last week, we looked into the bundle adjustment problem and the question of how can we actually build models of the environment using images. Basically, that means we want to estimate the location of 3D points in the environment and at the same time the location of our camera. So that's actually what we have done so far over the last weeks. What we want to look today into the question is kind of how can we estimate or can we estimate the quality of those um, points and they typically depend on the number of control points I have on the ground. So points where I know their precise x, y, z location and how many of those should I actually exploit or should I use. There are several reasons for that. If I have a number of known or at least known with a high, high precision um, of control points in the environment I can um, use this, for example, to fix the scale issue that I have. And also, um, I'm able to relate the model that I generate with respect to existing maps that I may have, which use those known control points as a reference. Um, therefore, this is kind of more from the practical point of view, one of the important issues. So first, the f uh, for the first part of the lecture, we will look into the question, how accurate can we actually measure those points? Uh, in practice, so there are not that many derivations here, it's more report and what we typically find in those systems and then some notes on what needs to be considered if we actually record those image material. Okay, so if we want to build, so you've seen this slide already, if you want to build map, that means the 3D location of points uh, in the environment on the ground from an airplane, you take images, the, the main technique to actually solve this problem is the bundle adjustment problem. And basically estimates the location of a large number of points, also called new points, on the ground, given images taken from an airplane, and we have a couple of control points down here, which we can use, for example, to fix the scale. There are other means for fixing the scale issue. For example, if you use GPS IMU information on the airplane, uh, we may get rid of some of the control points or the majority of those control points, but this is kind of the traditional setup without that. Again, the main idea of the bundle adjustment problem was I have a number of observed points in different images, so the point I observed in image J, and I have the main equation how the 3D coordinate of this point is projected into my image. And Basically, I have this equation for every point that I see of a potentially large number of images, and the goal is to find the location, the 3D location of the point, and the parameters of the projection, which includes the position of the camera and also the um, intrinsic parameters of that camera, in order to minimize the error that we would obtain if you would project this, the estimated location 
through the estimated projection matrix into our image and um, how far are we in the end away from the observed coordinates. So a typical setup that we have also seen so far. So we have an image and we fly in stripes. So these were the examples that we also looked into. So we, have a, we take a couple, we, we fly in the flying direction, take images either in a fixed interval if I fly with a constant speed. Um, and I need to make sure that I have an overlap between the, between the consecutive images and also those images so between, the stri uh, between the stripes. And so kind of the overlap in this direction is also called end lap and the overlap in this direction is also called the side lap. So if you kind of boil this down to um, just the projection center, so these crosses are the projection centers, and then in this example, this is kind of one aerial image that I get. And the distance between the two images, between the projection centers of the cameras at the two different points in time is my baseline. And so I have a, typically a fixed baseline if I fly with a constant speed and expose the images at a certain frequency in this direction. And typically the end lap, so the overlap in the images in this direction, and I fly in this direction, is, uh, is larger compared to this direction. So in a typical setup, we have kind of the difference here is kind of one baseline, and between the images of the stripes, approximately two baselines, or up to two baselines, what you typically find. And so here he you can see this example. The image is taken at this location, is basically this image over here covers the whole area. The second image has been taken here, so they have an overlap in this example of 60% in this direction and 20% in this direction. And then if we do this, we have to see one of those images, one of the examples we also used in the lectures two weeks ago on the bundle adjustment. So in this example, we had kind of 49 points that we observe where these four points at the corners have been control points, taking uh, 21 images, yes, three times seven images. So flying this direction, coming back, and flying in this direction again. So this leads to the final geometry, can, can lead to typical geometries of uh, this type. And there are a certain number of points that we typically distinguish. So one of the things are those crosses, and these are the projection centers of the cameras, as you've seen before. Those black points over here, uh, they're called tie points. These are points which I can see in multiple images. So I can use them to connect those images. Or in German also Verknüpfungspunkte or Verknüpfungspunkte. So this is a point that I can see from multiple um, images. And these are the important ones to actually connect those images. There may be a larger number of new points in the individual images. And I, um, um, in, in addition to that, but we are considering here kind of these, um, the, these, uh, these tie points. This is exactly kind of those points which are labeled here. So in this example, for one image, these were kind of up to nine of those tie points. Um, then we have kind of the triangles here are full control points. This means control points for which they, I know they are x, y, and that location. And I may also have those so-called height control points. And why they are important, we will see in this lecture today, where the z coordinate, the height coordinate of that control point is known. And where I may not necessarily know the x, y location accurately. So one of those examples where I can easily generate those points are, for example, lakes. So if I know the, the elevation or the height of a lake, I can at least approximate um, points on that lake. If I can identify them, um, that, that's something which can be tricky if it's a very um, homogeneous surface. But um, mm -hmm. if I may use the, uh, the boundary of that lake, then I know the height quite accurately and can use them, for example, as height control points. Okay, so this is an example for the image number one that has been taken, and this is image number two, image number three, um, and so on and so forth. So, and the important thing is, or something we will investigate, is that the uncertainty of the locations of those points, which I can estimate, depends on how many control points I have in my environment. Of course, the more control points, the better, but as you will see, not only the the number of control, point, co control points matters, but also the question where they are located in the environment and what type of control points they are. Of course, full control, point, full control points are the best control points that I have when I know the X, Y, and Z location accurately, but um, I may exploit also only hate control points to avoid certain types um, of problems that we can encounter. So the main question is where should we actually place those control points, especially those full control points? 
Should they be in the boundary? Should they be some of them in the middle? Should they be equally distributed over the environment? And this is kind of the main question um, for practical applications. Because generating these full control, po control points is typically an expensive procedure. So I need to go out in the field, measure those points accurately, label those points. As those points must be visible or at least identifiable through an operator from uh, the aerial images. So there are a couple of things which make knowing those control points quite expensive for aerial photography. So I'm interested in actually reducing the number of full control points that I need. So, so the main question is, how, where should I place the different types of control points? And you will see now a couple of examples on which accuracies you typically can obtain if we place control points in different locations. And we will see certain patterns and can use this as a guideline on where to place those control points. So you will see a couple of images of this type you know, over the next minutes. So what does this mean? So these triangles are again full control points. And, so, and every of those dots here are points that I'm going to want to estimate. The height of this point here is the uncertainty of those points. So here in the control points, the uncertainty is, is zero because I assume to know those control points accurately or, ex or very accurately. And so the question is, what is the uncertainty of the remaining points? In this case, this would be two points. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six points, of which four are control points. So I have these two points over here, which are um, new points. So points which I measured, but which are not control points. So in you always see a mu over here. This is the uncertainty, the average uncertainty of those new points, and also kind of the maximum uncertainty of those new points that I have. And just by looking into evaluating different configurations that we obtain, we can see does it make sense to place the control points at certain locations. So for example, this was kind of the smallest example that we have. We have control points at all four borders and two, point, two intermediate points. And the question is, what is the uncertainty of these points? And so we are very close to our um, sigma zero, so the uncertainty with which you actually can measure those points. Um, of course, in the end, how accurately I can measure those points in the image multiplied by the image scale number, um, so the, the direct relation between how accurately I can measure the points and how accurately I can estimate from the measured point in the image the location of the point um, on the ground. So if we now increase the area that we are mapping. So this is a transition from here to here. We still have only control points at the borders, one, two, three, four, but we have a larger number of points now, so we have a grid of one, two, three, four, five, and one, two, three. So we have a larger number of points, but we can actually see already from the drawing is that the uncertainty increases. So here the uncertainty increases, or the uncertainty here in the middle increases, which makes sense. So we have a larger number of points, which are spatially distributed in the environment of a larger area. We have the same number of control points in the same locations. So this intuitively makes sense. So the, the larger the environment is, the larger the uncertainty uh, will actually get. And so kind of those numbers here in those circles are the kind of the important numbers. So here the average uncertainty of, the, of all the points, which are non-control points, increases, and also the maximum uncertainty. So one of the things which is interesting to see now is that the maximum uncertainty that we get, we actually have along those borders. So this is the point of maximum uncertainty over here. This is 1.44. And this, even this one is pretty high with 1.4. The one in the middle is lower, actually. So it because it's controlled by has these control points on all, this, all of its sides. So the maximum uncertainty that we are going to experience is along the borders of um, the area that I, that I measure. And this is something which we which will observe uh, not only in these examples, also over larger examples. So what we can do is now we can again scale up those, those problems. So it's kind of, these are the two plots we had in the previous slide. We can now simply scale up those problems with a larger number of points and then see exactly the same pattern. So we have large uncertainties at those borders towards the middle. The uncertainties decrease and then increase again towards the borders, kind of the same here. So the largest uncertainty we have here in those areas where um, I'm at the border in the middle between two control points. So in this case, it's, it's hard to read 3.16 and 3.14. Um, 
There are those points over here. In the middle, we are around 2.1. Um, so we can see the larger we make the environment, the larger the uncertainty gets and the maximum uncertainty we have at, those bo at the borders. And it seems if we scale up the environment larger and larger and larger, we have an increase in uncertainty, but the, but the increase is not that dramatic. Of course, here kind of we scale the environments by a factor of whatever, three or four. We basically need four and we double the uncertainty that we, the average uncertainty that we obtain in those environments. So the, the, there's definitely an increase, but the increase may not be too bad over larger environments. But the key thing is kind of the uncertainty at the borders are those which matter. Again, okay, we had those. So the larger I make the environment, you can see here, the larger the average uncertainty and the maximum uncertainty. Okay, so the first thing I could do is, okay, then let's simply cover the boundaries densely with control points. So that every second point here on the boundary should be a control point. So if I do this, so basically what I do, I nail down every second point here at the, at the boundaries, then I actually obtain those plots over here. And this looks like already much better. So we can see we have control points, or even control points at every point, or every second point here, every point in this direction. Um, so every second baseline in the flying direction and every in every stripe. Um, so here in this example, I'm flying in this direction, this pattern. So we can see that we have a very homogeneous distribution of the uncertainty over here. So the distribution is smallest near to the control points, around one here, a little bit lower, and even in the middle is kind of with 1.1 rather homogeneous uh, uncertainty all over the environment. So a dense coverage of the control points, as we can see here, even going from smaller to larger problem, only very in, in, in very small um, intervals, not intervals, in very small steps increases the average uncertainty. Although the number of points that I have in here, of course, grows, grows, grows quadratically, but the number of control points I add um, grows linearly because it's just the boundary. So I'm adding a quadratic number of points and a linear number of control points, and still my uncertainty more or less stays the same or grows very moderately. So that's actually it's a very, very nice property. So if we can nail the, the boundary, I get very, very accurate results. And even if I add control points in the middle, this doesn't change the situation dramatically. So what we also already see here is that the uncertainty, even in the middle, very far away from the control points, so the maximum distance to all control points, the uncertainty is only slightly larger than the uncertainty we typically experience at the boundaries. So if we now add control points in the middle, so instead, these were the kind of, again, the two plots we had in the previous slide, and we add control points in the middle, a control point in the middle. Again, this leads to a reduction in the uncertainty, but the kind of the maximum uncertainty doesn't change much. Um, and the average uncertainty slightly drops, as we can see here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We can also do that, but the pro so the problem is, so this is nearly no change or very small change. The reason for this is if we go back, like in this example, so the maximum uncertainty that we encounter actually is actually at the boundaries. And it's actually the smallest uncertainty that we have found is find is here. Of course, we can nail this point down. This will definitely reduce uncertainty. But the, in, the, the, in, the decrease in uncertainty is very small. It's, it, it makes more sense to place those control points at the boundary where we have a very large uncertainty. Okay, so we have been here. So the thing is, okay, if this is kind of a very good setup. So if I have a large number of control points, I can place them at the boundaries of, my, of the environment I'm, I want to map. Now I say, okay, this may be still a too large number of control points that I want to add. So the, the thing I can do is I can basically skip a few of them. So let's say every second one I skip, or I place it only every four baselines, or every eight baselines. This is something I can do. So this is, again, the, one of the original problems with the large uncertainties here at the boundaries. And I just kind of place those um, control points in, for example, every four baselines. So then after, only after having taken four images on the ground, I see the next uh, control point at the boundary. And this 
leads to a substantial reduction of the uncertainty compared to the example where I had only uh, the control points at the border. Of course, this is still a linear increase in the number of control points that I need with respect, um, so if I'm adding um, if I'm adding new points in terms of size of the of the of one of the, of the environment, so if I increase the size of the environment, have a quadratic increase in points that I measure, and it's still a linear increase in number of control points. But at least I have only a fourth um, of the control points compared to the setup where I kind of nail down every point at the boundaries. And the increase is not too much. So here it's kind of um, 1.16, and if you look down to those examples over here, I think it was the largest one. Um, we are, have been approximately around one. So it's definitely larger, but given that we only used a quarter of the control points, the increase is rather moderate. And of course, we can do now the same thing depending on the accuracy we want to have. Adding a control point every two baselines, every four baselines, every eight baselines, so every two, four, and eight baselines. No, no, so two, four, and eight, like this. And so I'm obviously reducing the number of control points. Um, uh, can obviously reduce the number of control points with a moderate increase of uncertainty. So depending on the uncertainty that I have, I need to place the control points and the kind of standard recipes to place them at the boundaries of my problem and depending which accuracy I want to achieve in the end, I need to less dense or more densely sample my boundaries. So this is kind of the cost I need to put into the mapping process in terms of measuring those ground control points making them visible in an aerial image. And so the more control points I add at the boundaries, the more accurate my results will be. And the standard strategy is to place them at the boundaries and depending how much I want to invest in terms of uh, working time and the accuracy of the result that I want to have, the more densely I need to sample the boundaries. Which kind of intuitively makes sense. Because kind of the boundaries are those open end points, which are not, so these, all the points lying on those boundaries are, are those points which are not constrained on this side because there are no further points measured over here. Um, and those points in the middle are constrained through, the, through those neighboring points. So I have the largest uncertainties at the boundaries and they kind of need to <coughs> fix the boundaries of the mapped area in order to, to obtain accurate results. So, for the point at the border, the important thing is that the XY position for those points is known. So these are the planimetric control points where I may not know the, the, the height. But of course, if I have the height, as we also see in, in a minute, this substantially improves my results. But one of the important things for the X and Y position um, is that we know of also the X and Y location of the control points at the boundaries. And I typically, depending on the accuracy that I have, I basically skip a certain number of baselines and only add those control points um, that I want to have. And so we have a homogeneous growth of the uncertainty inside the blocks if the boundary is fixed. And it's actually a logarithmic um, increase of the uncertainty with the block size. So this is kind of something which is good. So I can actually scale up those block sizes quite large enough, only a logarithmic increase of the uncertainty that I have in here. So this was kind of what we said. If we increase the size of the environment, what was this in the beginning here? Um, we definitely have an increase in uncertainty, but we kind of always doubled in this example the uncertainty here and had a moderate increase. Uh, the size of the environment had a moderate increase in uncertainty. Okay. So in practice, if we had to use different end labs and side labs, so this was kind of the overlap in the flying direction of the end lab or to the side lab, we had achieved different accuracies in the XY location. So these are kind of the theoretical precisions that we typically obtain, that we can obtain. So if we have, um, an, this is always an end lab of 60%, in this case, depending on the side labs of 20%, this is basically the accuracy that we get. So we have the linear relationship between how accurately we can measure those points in the image to how accurately they are, they are mapped in the environment. And this depends on a constant factor. And this also depends on the image scale number. So this was the relation between the flying height and the, um, and the camera constant. So here's, here's the relation. 
So the higher I fly without changing my camera constant, so if I fly twice as high, my points have twice the uncertainty. This makes sense because if I fly higher, I observe a larger area of the environment, so my uncertainty of those points um, would increase. If we increase the side lap to 60%, so even the flying direction is 60% overlap, we actually get better. So if we take more images, we reduce the uncertainty, which also, make, which also makes sense. And um, if we have control points only at the four border points, then the uncertainty that we obtain, or the average uncertainty, depends on the uh, the size of the block that I have. So the larger the block is, the larger the uncertainty. And this is kind of with the number of points I have in that block. We have this increase over here. Okay, there's one other effect, which is an interesting effect, and this is the effect of um, noise in the, in the roll, so in the, in the roll angle. So if the airplane flies and has an error in the, in the roll, um, we can actually have the effect if we kind of identify a point, so let's say we have so these are always the, the locations of the camera, and this is kind of the true situation over here. So then we estimate a point here in the overlapping areas of this point, and kind of through the triangulation, I estimate the points on the surface. This is without any noise in the roll, so the roll is always zero. Assuming that we, haven't, we have some noise in the roll angle, then it can happen, so if you kind of the image the airplane has been here, slightly rolled in this direction, and while it was flying here, slightly rolled in this direction, so just some small noise in the roll, that actually the point will be seen as lying kind of on a small mountain. So we basically have a curved uh, surface and not a flat surface. This is something which is actually very hard to compensate because if I fly, because in the flying direction, I will have very similar it's very similar noise, and it takes a long time until I return and measure the point um, a second time. So I, I don't have a third observation of those points in order to, to nail that down because I'm flying once in this direction and then once coming back. It's just this overlapping area. So what is a way to actually reduce this, this effect of kind of bending this surface, getting wrong estimates for the altitude, for the, for the height of those points, for the z-coordinate? So this is an error in the z-coordinate of those points. So if I want to fix the z-coordinate of a point, I need to add one of the things I could add more control points. So I could add a couple of full control points in, in the overlapping areas of the two images. Then this problem would, would be resolved because then I know that this point is not here but actually lies on the surface. But actually I'm not exploiting the x and y location of those points. So I'm also for fixing this effect, I'm only exploiting the, the z, or the altitude of that point. So what I can use, I can use is my height control points. So points, <laughs> but I do not necessarily need to know the x and y location of those points very accurately. But I can identify those points and know the altitude of those points. And if I do this, and I place those height control points in a certain distance in the overlapping areas of the images between those stripes, I can actually eliminate this effect. Because I, can, I know that this point is not lying somewhere uh, up in the sky, but it's actually on that surface. And um, I have control points on the surface, and this leads to the correction. And I will end up with having this situation. So in terms of the precision I get in the z-coordinate compared to the precision in the um, xy-coordinate I was discussing before. I also have my image scale number, and this basically depends on the spacing of these eight <coughs> control points along the sides. So it's a constant factor times i, and this is kind of the number of baselines um, I have between images um, for having those control points. So basically the control point interval that I have. So the, 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 the larger this interval gets, so do every second baseline, every third baseline, every fourth baseline, this uncertainty increases here. So kind of in the end, in most practical setups, what we can 
achieve, what we typically obtain is a relationship between the measured, the XY uncertainty that I have on the ground, and the measured uncertainty in my images depends on the image scale number. This is basically depends on two things, the camera that I'm using, of course, is the camera constant, and the, fly, the altitude with which I'm flying, the height over ground. So if I fly lower with the same camera, I can measure my points more accurately. But of course, it takes longer to fly in order to cover the same area. So the lower I fly, the higher the uncertainty that I, um, the, sorry, the, the higher I fly, the higher the uncertainty, the lower I fly, the lower the uncertainty of the points um, that I have. And I have this linear relationship between how accurately can I can actually locate a point in my image and where this point is on the ground. And this depends exactly on the height of a ground or the image scale number. So it's the height of a ground divided by the camera constant. OK, so the next question is for practical situation. How can we actually? Obtain, so if you, we would like to avoid this situation. We would like to have a, an accurate as possible map of the environment, but just have a very, very small number of control points. So how can we resolve this issue in practical situations? If we don't want to label whatever hundreds of control points on the ground, and then manually select them in the aerial images and measure them before so what could I do to resolve this issue, to do it better in a practical situation? So one of the very obvious things is if I have a means for estimating the position of the airplane with, with high accuracy, I could avoid adding additional control points on the ground. So what I can use is I can use, I can add to the camera I have in my airplane a GPS receiver and maybe an IMU in you know, order to get a good estimate about the, the orientation of the airplane. And what, I'm, what I do if I have that, so I have my camera, my IMU and my, my GPS receiver and given that they are appropriately calibrated, I can fix the position of my camera with something like, say, 5 centimeter to 10 centimeter accuracy, to consider that the airplane is actually flying very fast. So also, you need to time synchronize all the different um, sensors on the airplane, and you need to precisely calibrate that. So in the end, you will end up with something around, let's say, 5 centimeter accuracy for your GPS. And this can be done rather cheap, <coughs> estimating the position through the GPS. What is more expensive is actually estimate the orientation through the initial measurement unit. So um, a good initial measurement unit, unit is quite costly, can easily cost whatever 1,000 euros in order to get a precise estimate of the orientation of the plane. And the best results I obviously get if I combine all those means, because what it basically does, it adds an additional full control point, so with known x, y, z coordinate, and the orientation where the camera is pointing to into the um, projection center of the camera. So you can see this as adding control points in the projection centers of my camera. And this allows me to very accurately estimate the location where the camera has been taken. And this uncertainty obviously propagates directly to the points on the ground. And I can estimate them very accurately. I can fix the scale issue that I have. So I don't need the control points for the scale. I can, in theory, even get rid of my control points at all. So if I use this approach, I do not necessarily need the control points in order to estimate the location of the points on the ground. But what could be a reason to require control points? So we may still want to have some control points. Could you imagine any a reason why we would like to make one consider to add additional control points? So this is one of the things where I can use it for exactly. So in order to have an external control over or a way to verify what my GPS told me. That's definitely one point. What could be an additional reason to do that, to add control points? Increasing 
redundancy. I increase redundancy, but at a very high cost. So there may be easier ways if I just think about this by, for example, flying multiple times over the, over, the, over the surface. So there's a more practical point depending on what you want to do with the resulting model in the end. The scale factor I can typically fix very well through the GPS and IMU information that I have. This is not really the limiting factor. So typically I acquire information over the environment and I want to combine this with other maps that I have. So I have other maps of that environment and I may want to whatever, improve the, uh, the, the, the result of the map or add a new area to that map. I need to make sure that I can actually um, have the maps in the same coordinate system. And if I can, use, I can use those control points in order to align the maps that are existing with the uh, information that I obtain. So if not everything is perfectly aligned in my GPS coordinate system, I can use those control points in order to make that alignment. And therefore, in practice, there are typically a few number of control points that um, are, are taken into account to account for the difference between the GPS coordinate system and the targeted map coordinate system or the coordinate system of the maps to which I want to relate the information that I have. Another thing that hasn't been mentioned yet, I can also use this as an additional source for calibrating, for, for knowing something about the calibration of my camera. Because if you have an airplane, the camera is outside the airplane measuring, taking images, depending on the altitude of the airplane, depending on how long it's flying, actually the temperature of this camera may change. So if you're flying high over ground, it can be pretty cold. This can has an impact on the camera constant or has an impact on the camera constant. And through those control points, you have an additional source for um, taking the camera constant into account. What you typically actually need to do, you need to estimate the camera constant for either individual images or individual stripes, take into account that the camera constant can actually change. And we can actually see this if we look to some data sets or kind of test data sets. And there are a couple of them where there have been a number of control points on the ground which have been measured with, with um, terrestrial um, mapping with a very high accuracy, so in the order of one to two centimeters. So I know the XY position of those control points with up to one to two centimeters. And then there is, an, with an airplane, a quite large area has been covered with a large number of images, or with, in this case, 440 images, multiple points per image. And then the goal is to estimate the location of those points and actually compare them to the kind of near ground truth result or ground truth with up to one to two centimeters. And so what I can do now is also take into account the, um, the effect of the first of the individual overlaps of those images. So I have large overlaps or small overlaps. What's kind of the effect um, on the result? And I can also take into account how much does the calibration actually matters. So one of the things I can do is, and this is actually what's shown here in the first line, are the results that I get for different overlaps. So the first one is always the end overlap, so between consecutive images, and the second value is kind of the side overlap, so between the stripes. So this is kind of um, more densely taken images, so a very large overlap and a comparably small overlap. And the important thing is kind of what is the, the, the mean error that I actually estimate in my result with respect to what I should measure given the uh, precision of those measurements. And this is kind of these, the values here in these areas. So, and I, so the theoretical result that I should get if I relate the uncertainty that I obtain with the, with the uncertainty about locating my images in the image scale number, I should end up in the best of the situations with a factor of 0.87. This was kind of one of those factors we had before. For this setup, for this setup, even smaller, one point, whatever, five, uh, eight or 0 0.6. And so depending if I don't do any self-calibration at all, I actually have here larger errors. If I do a calibration, so estimating a camera constant and the other parameters of my, of my calibration parameters, I actually can reduce the error that I get. 
So it makes sense to calibrate the cameras even if you, so for the flight. What I can even do, I can estimate the camera parameters for every stripe. So that means that the camera calibration parameters change over time. And one of the reasons why they change over time actually changes in temperature. Then we can actually see that we can substantially reduce again the number, um, the, the, the error that we, that we obtain. We get more precise if we have our calibrated camera. And for this overlap, we shouldn't end up with a value of 0 0.1, assuming that there's a very limited number of systematic remaining errors in there just by the uncertainty, so the theoretical precision that we, that we can actually get, and taking into account that those control points also are not perfectly known. They're only known, in this case, up to 1, to two, uh, one or 1 1.2 centimeters. So this is, gives the difference between 0 0.87 and 1. So this actually, I can't get much better if the control points are not known more precisely. Here, I could still get a little bit better. I should end up with something like 1.5. So, um, the, but the, the important thing is the higher the overlap, the better, and this is kind of one of the best results I can obtain, given, of course, I'm approaching the theoretical precision that I can obtain, and the remaining difference to the theoretical precision that I could obtain comes from the not absolutely perfectly known control points. You can also look how, how the distribution of the error typically changes. So what you see down here is actually the error. So zero centimeter, one, two, three, four of the individually measured control points, and how many points this is. So the majority of the points has an error of up to two centimeters, and we have maximum errors of something around 4 or 4.1 centimeters that we obtain in those settings. So as a result, we can map environments with taking aerial images in the order of, say, in this order of around, say, 2 to 3 centimeters. We can actually nail down the XY location of those points accurately. One of the things we also need to take into account if we do that is actually flight planning, so how should we fly? So I know we have said if we fly in those stripes and the question is what are the overlaps? It's a pretty clear decision, so should I go for 60-20 like overlap or 80-60 um, overlap? So it's a kind of, kind of the two so values between those two overlaps you find, so between 60 and 80 in flying direction and between 20 and 60 in the overlapping direction. But there are also other things where it takes into account when we should fly. Things like, what's the weather? What about visibility? So I can actually see all the points that I want to observe. And also in terms of time or uh, time of day. So what are things that can impact um, the quality of the results that I get with respect to those, those factors? So obviously in terms of weather, if it's very cloudy, can be suboptimal, depending on how high or low the clouds are. <clears throat> also, what, what impacts visibility? What are aspects that, why I may take visibility into account? Yeah? The light, if it's too dark. Yeah. So, too dark is definitely an issue. It's not directly brightness, but something related to brightness. Reflections can be, but typically not that much. It's actually, strong shadows can be an issue. Because just to the different brightness levels that we obtain in those images, given that there's strong sunlight, and depending on the direction of the sun, it can generate large shadows. And in those shadows, it may be hard to identify the points that we're interested in. So this definitely something to consider. So there's a large number of different aspects that need to be taken into account uh, when we can fly. So all the thing is kind of vegetation. Depending on the area that I want to fly over, uh, there's lots of vegetation. They obstruct relevant points. This can also substantially limit the time of the year when I can actually fly. So if you take all those points into account, the important thing is that actually the time for flying is actually quite limited. And the other thing is actually how do we actually find the control points that we measured in our aerial images, also something which is relevant. So how do we do that? How do we actually actually measure points and how can we then find them in our aerial images? Any idea how we can do that? So 
So it's a very, very basic procedure. So you go at some position, you measure this point very accurately, and then you simply take paint and label the point that you measure with a typically highly reflective color or a color that is, doesn't occur very often in the surroundings. So green may not be the best option if you're there out in the fields. And then you basically inspect those images and try to find the colored patterns and find those control points. And this is the reason why actually generating a lot of control points is an expensive procedure. So we want to limit going out in a lot of locations, measuring those points, labeling those points, painting those points in order to find them from the aerial, area, in the aerial uh, images. So having the chance of just adding additional sensors to my vehicle, so to my airplane, and reducing the number of control points that need to be used is, a big, is of big value because it simply reduces the time that is needed um, you know, to measure and label those points. <coughs> so again, depending on the results that we have, we typically have an end lab between 60 to 80 or 60 to 90 percent. And the site lab that I used in those examples of 20 percent is actually something which is typically very small, so you get better results if the uh, site lab is also in the order of 60 percent. But of course, you need to fly more often to cover the same um, part of the environment. Okay. Um, also, camera matters, temperature issues. But one of the important things is self-calibration should be taken into account. So it makes sense to actually calibrate or estimate at least deviations from the original calibration parameters, even not for the data set, but even for parts of the data set. So for example, for every stripe, if you want to want to get a highly accurate results. So it was an example we saw in this test block up and via that calibrating the camera for the individual stripes independently um, or the deviation from the original um, parameters substantially improves the result. So kind of to sum this up, the key parameters for taking this into account are can we use additional sensors? What about the control points? How many locations of the control points do we have? Um, when should we fly? How high should we fly? Which camera should we use in terms of camera constant? And what's the overlap in terms of end lab and side lab that we are considering? These are all factors which I can add them this improves my results, but also comes at a cost. Either I need more expensive sensors, or I need to have many additional manual work to go out, and I just need, to, or it takes longer time to acquire those images. These are all parameters that I need to take into account. I can do better. It simply typically takes longer, is more expensive, but I get better results. So in terms, in terms of the, the take-home message from this lecture is that Using images, aerial images, is a, an important source for estimating the location of 3D points on a quite large scale because due to the way images are generated that I get the full projection of the scene into my 2D plane, I can quite densely estimate the location of points in those images. So I can generate comparably dense images. And I can do this with an uncertainty in the X and Y location of, let's say, approximately two to three centimeters. That's something which can obtain. If I fly substantially lower, I may even increase those results, but at typically flying heights, I end up in, in this order. So if this is sufficient for my application, then this is a technique which we should use. We also need to think about control points. So either we have GPS and IMU information, then we only need a small number of control points. And if I don't have GPS IMU information on my airplane, then I need to have a number of full control points around the border and the spacing basically determines how accurately, how accurately I can measure my points and I typically need height control points along the stripes for this kind of Toblerone effect that I, um, that I may have. That's it from my side. Are there any questions from your side regarding um, the kind of the result that we can assume to get given that we use aerial images and button adjustment technique in order to estimate the 3D location of points in the environment. So if this is not the case, I'll make a five minute break and then continue with the question how we actually can generate autophotos from images taken, for example, from airplanes. Thank you very much.